Hello again, everybody. Welcome to our church service here on May the 24th. I hope it's a good day for you. I hope it's been a good week for you, Ashley. Um, we're just going to kind of continue on a little bit from where we were last week. We were talking about waiting on God and what that means. It's not pacing the floor. It's not wringing your hands and twiddling your thumbs. It's it's an active thing. And um, I hope you're doing that, by the way, during the pandemic. We're still in this isolation mode kind of thing. There's been some restrictions lifted, depending where you're living and where, where you are watching this. Uh, but still, overall, we're still in kind of that um, stay-at-home type of mode. And um, this is a thing that you and I need to take advantage of and be waiting on God. So we're going to pick up on that a little bit more this week. We're going to see some good examples of this from Scripture. We're also going to hear a great testimony about it as well. As we begin, let's hear the words of Scripture from Psalm 103, David said these words in Psalm 103, verse 8 to verse 14. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, we're so thankful that you don't treat us as our sins deserve. Oh my goodness, that's an incredible thing, that you would remove our sins far from us that you as a good and a caring and a loving father would pity us and take care of us. Oh, you're a good, good father. We're so thankful for that today. As we come before you in our service of worship, we want to draw near to you. We want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. We want to honor you with the fruit of lips that give praise to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, as David confessed there in Psalm 103, as the Lord pities uh, us, just like a father pities his children, you know, he is a good, good father, and we should tell him that. There's a great worship song we're going to sing right now. Many of you know it, Good, Good Father. Let's worship him now, shall we?
perfect to worship God. I love that song. He's a good, good father. And we can't say that often enough, really. God is so good. You think about things that you've enjoyed in your life, I've enjoyed in my life. How can you not say that God's good? Boy, I want us to review a couple verses that we looked at last week. If you weren't with us last week, don't worry, I'll catch you up here. If you were with us last week, hey, this is just going to reinforce you uh, on where we were. Those two verses, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. The Old Testament verse is Isaiah 40, verse 31. Here's what uh, Isaiah said. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Remember we talked last week about the fact that this word wait is not a uh, pacing the floor, a nervously impatient waiting. It's a, an expectant waiting. Another version uses the word hope for, or hope in the Lord. Uh, so it has this earnest expectation to it. So we're waiting, but we're viewing to something. We're looking to something ahead. Um, and it's an active waiting. That passage in the New Testament was Luke chapter 19, verse 12 and 13. And uh, Jesus said this, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minutes, and said to them, do business till I come. Remember, we focus on that phrase, do business till I come. And the, the, the word actually means to trade. It's an active verb there. And so we should be doing something with the time that we're waiting on God to make his next move. So we're in this pandemic period, you know, where there's a lot of um, waiting, as it were. Uh, so this should be an active waiting. We should be praying, seeking the Lord, asking God, what do you want? Uh, how do you want to prepare us when we go back to our churches? How do you want to prepare me for, for this day? What do you want me to do this day? So we should be doing business. We should be trading. We should be uh, praying and seeking God and then going and doing. It's an active verb there. So think about that because this is going to come into play in our passage of Scripture today. We're going to see how the apostles did this while they were waiting for what the Lord was promising to come, which was the Holy Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to get into our passage today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're giving us a golden opportunity here during this COVID-19 crisis time where we're at home much of the time. In fact, we're still in that. Many of the restrictions have been lifted and we're thankful for that, but we're still in this waiting, holding pattern. Help us to use this time wisely. Help us to do business until you come and help us to do business until such things would change where, uh, where, where some of these restrictions are lifted. Father, we do continue to pray for those in uh, government positions who are um, taking the authority and have the authority to make these decisions for us. Father, give them wisdom about timing, about what's right, about um, what businesses should and shouldn't open at this time. And Father, even for the opening of churches, we wait on you for that, oh God. We want the freedom to be able to come, but it needs to be safe as well. So Lord, we're calling upon you and asking you to lead and to direct our um, civic and political leaders. Father, continue to protect those who are on the front lines every day in, in hospitals and nursing homes and other medical areas. Father, just continue to watch over them and over their families. Those in retail also who are uh, in these essential services where there's a risk as well. Father, protect them by the power of Psalm 91 uh, that we've looked at so often. Thank you so much for your promise to protect us, oh God. Father, also Keep us mindful of people who may be lonely and suffering and discouraged at this time. Help us to pick up the phone and make a phone call or make a social distance visit if that's appropriate and if it's available. Help us to reach out to people who are out of circulation right now because of the pandemic situation. Help us not to forget about them. Let them know that they're thought about, that they're loved. Help us to be busy thinking of others, not just ourselves during this time. Father, we want to go to your word now. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. There's some things, some very important things in this passage that we can learn from, that we can glean from, that will help us in this waiting period that we find ourselves in right now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to read to you from Acts chapter 1. We, we started there last week, and uh, of course, Jesus had given marching orders. He basically said he was, he, he was going back to heaven, which he did. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus went to heaven. And uh, he left some pretty clear instructions for the apostles and the others, the other followers, uh, what they should do. And the instructions were, wait, <laughs> um, and till I give you the promise of my Father. We know that to be the Holy Spirit. So there was a 10-day period there between the time that Jesus went back to heaven and when the Holy Spirit came. And so 
the $64,000 question is, what did they do for 10 days? There was, you're going to find out in this passage here, there was about 120 people in this upper room. And um, did they just pray the whole time? What did they do? They did some stuff. Let's go there to Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 15 to 26. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Ekaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us the entire time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay, may the Lord bless the reading of his word today. You know, there's some really good stuff in this passage that we're going to bring out here. How the apostles, as they were waiting on the Lord in prayer, not just the apostles either, but all 120 people there. While they were waiting on the Lord in prayer, they, they started to do business. There were some things that needed to take place. God is telling us to do some things too. None of us are called to be idle. We should be praying and saying, Lord, what would you have me do even today? I want you to hear a testimony right now from a lady in our church. Her name is Shar Rodway. This is a lady that goes out walking her dog every day. She prays, she reads her Bible, but she's always looking at what God would have her do today. And you know something? God uses this lady in a number of ways. You're going to be blessed by this. Take a look at this, at this testimony right now. Good morning. This testimony shows how God's plan and his timing is always perfect. Almost two years ago, my mother-in-law gave me a bag full of cards. Christmas cards, get well cards, think of you cards. At the time, I thought, what will I do with all these cards? I'm not a send a card kind of person, but she gave them to me and I'll just hang on to them, I thought. About a year and a few months passed, and a friend of mine called to tell me her friend, who used to live on the same street growing up with her, had been diagnosed with lung and bone cancer. I knew the friend, but only met her a couple of times. This person lives on the street that I walk every day, so remembering I had all these cards, I thought, I'll bring one and tell her I'll pray for her. After getting home from dropping off this card, I felt guilt as if I'm supposed to do more, but what could I possibly do? The following day, I felt God telling me to bring another card. Talking to myself, I thought, God knows I brought one yesterday. Really, you want me to bring another one? So this time I wrote out scripture, Psalm 112, 7, and also a prayer for her healing. The following day, another card more healing scriptures, and more prayers for healing. This went on for a few months, sometimes skipping a day or so, but the cards had to be brought. I just felt God telling me. More scripture, deeper prayers. My friend called me to say she and her friend had went over to see her. They had all grew up on the same street. She had shown them all the cards that she had got and she really enjoyed how it helped her with the fear and calmed her down trying to deal with living with cancer. I was elated to think God was already working in her life with the cards bringing her comfort. More scripture, more prayers, and more healing was needed. Then my friend called me again just last week 
to tell me that her friend went to the doctors. The doctor had told her the cancer was shrinking. God knew from the start of these cards how they would be used. Praise God. That was a great testimony. I really appreciate Shar. You know, she's not idle. She's constantly on the lookout for ways the Lord could use her, including a way that she never thought possible. You know, sometimes we, we limit God. We think, well, no, that's not really how I do things or that's not my personality. And, and God often, of course, uses our personality. He plays to our strength. But sometimes he just calls us to do something that's outside of the box. And he'll strengthen us and empower us to do it. And I really appreciate how Shar was used in this situation. God can use you too, you know. Um, we're going to find out that God is using people here while they're waiting on God. So again, the situation is there's 120 of God's gatherers, uh, God, sorry, God's uh, followers that are gathered in this upper room. Of those 120, 11 of them are the, the apostles without Judas who killed himself. The, uh, you know, Jesus' mother, some other prominent women, and a number of other close followers of Jesus. They're in this upper room. All they've been told is, wait until the promise of my Father comes. They have no idea what that looks like or what that's going to be. It is the Holy Spirit. We know that uh, from other scriptures, but they have no idea how this is going to come down. What do you do in the meantime? Well, they're praying, but they realize they have some business to take care of, too. So in their praying, they realize, you know, something we need to replace the office that Judas held. Jesus had, through prayer, selected those 12 men, hand-selected them. Judas was one of them. He disqualified himself. You know, the Bible kind of gives a very gruesome description here. I, I hope you, you held off on breakfast today because it says here, um, he describes Judas's death. You know, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that Judas went out and hung himself. It doesn't really give any details there. Uh, apart from that, Luke wants you to know, <laughs> or wants his first century readers to know that um, people who committed suicide, it was kind of morally neutral to a lot of people. A lot of his audience would have thought that. So he wants to let his re readers know this was a horrible thing. And so he gives that description that when, when Judas was hung himself, it says that he fell headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. Sounds horrible. He probably was hanging, the tree branch broke, whatever, he collapsed and, you know, oof. Anyway, you can kind of picture that. So there was actually a nickname given to that field. That the, if you recall from your Bible, um, Judas had betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But when he realized what he'd done was wrong, he went back and he had remorse, not repentance. He had remorse. Uh, he threw the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priest, and he, that's when he went out and hung himself. They didn't want to take the money and put it in the treasury because they knew it was blood money. So they bought this field called the Potter's Field. The field of blood was kind of the locals' nickname for it because it was purchased with blood money. And so Peter kind of gives that. He says, okay, so here's the deal. Judas was one of us. He had a very part, in a, a major part in this holy ministry. He needs to be replaced. And you might be saying, why bother? You got 11 guys that were going to get the job done. He was probably dead weight for much of the three years he walked with Jesus anyway. He was... He was uh, helping himself to money from the money pouch because he was the treasurer of, of the group. Uh, that was in John's Gospel, chapter 12, that was brought out. Uh, why not just go without Judas? You're basically going out without him for probably the second half of Jesus' ministry anyway. Let me give you two verses. Um, there's something to look forward to. These men, these apostles, have something to look forward to in the millennial kingdom. In... Um, let me see here. It, in Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus had made a promise to these 12 men, and Judas was still there at this time. He said this, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's an incredible promise of, of, of authority and responsibility. Judas discarded that, uh, but he said there would be 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel, sitting on 12 tr thrones, but now we only have 11. So Peter says, we must replace that position. Jesus made this promise. This is part of his plan. We're going to do it. That's not a hasty decision. Another verse, John, who is one of those 12, of course, he said in his book, uh, in the book of the Revelation, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, 
there's a description there of the new Jerusalem, which is the, 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 the millennial kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, God's people. It says, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you see, there has to be 12. Otherwise, um, th those prophecies aren't going to be true. So, so uh, the, Peter says, we need to replace Judas. He's not going to be, his name's not going to be on one of the foundations, and he's not getting one of the 12 thrones because he was the son of perdition. He disqualified himself by betraying the Son of God, and then he, he took his own life. So he, and Peter actually quotes from two different Psalms. They're not Psalms that are directed precisely at Judas, but they're Psalms that talk about a person like Judas, where it says, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Okay, that was from Psalm 69, verse 25. And then in verse 20, it quotes Psalm 108, or sorry, 109, verse 8, let another take his office. So Peter's saying from the Psalms, when you have a person who's reckless like that and they've disqualified their office, it needs to be replaced. And so, uh, and also those verses I just read there about um, Jesus saying in the millennial kingdom, um, there'll be 12 thrones. So Peter says, for that reason, we need to replace Judas. And good news is we got a crop of people who can fill this position. The bad news is only one can take it. So there's some important business. We could call this the first church business meeting since uh, the church began. The church hasn't really officially begun yet. We've got 120 of Christ's followers in the upper room. They're praying, they're waiting on God, and they're doing an important piece of business here. So I mean, let me bring that again to the present. What you do with your time, um, you know, the people you talk to, the phone calls you're making, the people you work with uh, or go to school with, um, those are important people. And your conversation with them, your uh, influence with them is very, very important. And it's part of you doing business until Jesus comes. You, we should be praying, God, how do you want me to be living my life? Who do you want me to speak to today? What do you want me to do? God, direct my life. I don't want to waste my time doing stuff that's not going to be profit the kingdom. So there needs to be an active uh, pursuit of God while we're waiting upon him in prayer. And that's what these men were doing. And um, so it says that they... They, they, they've got some criteria here, okay? So this is very, this is very critical. They've got some criteria here. And they, and, you know, they're not just going to pick anybody. So verse 21 and 22, here's what Peter said. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's some... Um, some critical stuff there. That that phrase there went in and out among us is actually a Jewish idiom. It, it means someone who's fam, has familiar and unhindered association. It's someone that was around all the time. You knew he was there, uh, and they were familiar to you. You recognized the guy, uh, and he was unhindered. He, in other words, he wasn't a problem. He he was on your side. So this is a person that's on our team. If I could use a football term, forgive me for using this, but uh, the apostles would have been the starting lineup and these other people would have been on the practice roster. They're very much a part of the organization. They're on the payroll, uh, but they're not on the front line. They can be moved from the practice roster. If there's an injury or someone needs to be replaced in the starting lineup, then a person from the practice roster in football can be moved to the starting lineup. So we have Judas, who is out of the starting lineup, and so we need to have him replaced. And so they put forth two men. And uh, it's interesting because um, the two men here are not mentioned anymore in Scripture. This is the only place where they're mentioned. Don't have a problem with that, by the way, because some people say, well, uh, these guys, how important were they? This is the only place they're mentioned. Well, not everyone's mentioned in Scripture. There was lots of followers of Jesus who never got their name mentioned at all. These two at least got their name mentioned once. So Peter puts forth some criteria he says they had to be, you know, coming in and out amongst, uh, in other words, they had to be familiar to us with an unhindered association. They were people that we would welcome. And they had to be from the very beginning, when the time that John the Baptist was baptizing, all the way through, they had to witness the resurrection, okay? That's a long time. He's not looking for Johnny come lately here. He needs people who... Uh, can do this job. This is a very specific position. Jesus spent all night in prayer picking the 12 apostles. And so we can't just 
insert somebody in there based on what I think, what I feel, what I want, mind, will, and emotions. Um, you know, it can't be someone just based on common sense. It has to be someone that the Lord would choose. Now, more on that in just a few minutes. Let's talk about the two guys that were brought forward. So this is pretty, pretty strict criteria. By the way, there would have been more than two. He only lists two. I'm not sure why they only list two, um, but there would have been more than two. Uh, we know that Jesus, after he resurrected from the dead in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, it says that he, he appeared to over 500 at one time. So there was definitely more than two. Um, not all of them would have been with following Jesus from the time of John the Baptist baptizing, but a number of them were. But anyway, we won't say more about that. Let's just say there was two people. And he, he mentioned the first one. Verse 23, they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is surnamed Justus, and Matthias. So we have this guy, Joseph Barsabbas. Barsabbas was, he was called that because it means son of the Sabbath, probably because he was born on a Sabbath day. Uh, not a bad uh, thing to have on your resume. Um, so he's one that's been there since the baptism of John the Baptist, uh, and all the way through the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, right up until the time of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. He's been familiar with the apostles. He's been um, coming and going with them and a follower with the multitudes and other times. Um, he's a good man. He's Saul. He's a follower of Jesus. Matthias, which is a short form, form for the word Mattathias. You'll see that name in the Old Testament a lot. Um, um, he's, he's also got the same resume as Joseph does. Uh, Joseph's uh, Roman name, by the way, was, was Justice. A lot of times the Jewish people had a Roman name as well, Gentile name, because of the Roman government. How do you pick between these two? Let me, um, let me stir the pot a little bit here. Uh, church father Eusebius, in his uh, records uh, of the church fathers, says about Joseph Barsabbas that um, he was once challenged by a group of unbelievers, whether he was a real, true follower of Christ, and he drank uh, a cup of snake venom to prove that he was a follower of Jesus and he was unharmed. Uh, so that's one of the things he's got to his his claim to fame, according to Eusebius, the church father, and he, he's not the only one that says that. Um, Matthias, according to Eusebius, was one of the 70 that, that were sent out in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus sends out the 70, they go two by two, and they witness to him of him in these different villages. So um, according to Eusebius, one of the church fathers, Papias, um, he was one of the 70. Later traditions say that Matthias was a missionary to the Ethiopians. So he also has a tremendous resume. How are you going to pick between these two guys? I mean, my goodness, both of them would be, you would think, are very qualified for this. Now, here's where we need to look at verse 24. So critical. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. There's a lot in that verse. So how are you going to pick between these two? They're going to pray about it. Okay, sometimes we use that as a flippant thing to buy time. Oh, uh, yeah, well, whatever. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'll pray about it. And we, we kind of say that. We don't really mean that we're going to actually pray about it. We just are trying to buy some time. But they're, they're saying we're going to pray. We need to seek the Lord on this. This is a very important position. We need the right person to fulfill this duty. And so we can't just take anybody. And we got two men here that both are capable of, of this job. So they pray. And then look what Peter said. You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all. That's an interesting word. It's only used here in the New Testament. A heart knower is what it is. God knows your heart. God knows my heart. These apostles sort of know Joseph and Matthias, based on the last three plus years, you know, they've been walking with Jesus and they've been very familiar with them. They, they have a good resume that way. They don't know everything about Joseph They don't and Matthias. They don't know everything that goes on behind closed doors, but they know someone who does, the Lord. Remember, Jesus chose those 12, 12 apostles. They said, well, kind of Jesus was only... 11 out of 12. He, he kind of muffed it with Judas. No, there was a purpose for him picking Judas. And so Peter's saying, we need to let the Lord choose who this person is going to be. As a matter of fact, he says, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, you know the hearts of these two men, Joseph Barsabbas and Matthias. They're both good men. We can't take both of them. We can only take one. Show 
which of these two you have chosen. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you prayed like that about some really important issue in your life? And when I say prayed, I don't mean you told God and then you made a decision 20 minutes later. I mean where you said, I'm not going anywhere until I get clearly from God what it is I'm supposed to do. It may be something like, what school am I going to apply to for college or university? It might be um, some sort of a major purchase that you need to make in your home. It might be um, something to do with a job situation, accepting a job offer or, or not, or moving. Or um, maybe it's a health decision you need to make for someone that you're a power of attorney or whatever. When was the last time you said, you know something? I need to know, God, what you think about this. I have some ideas based on my common sense. I put some pieces of the puzzle together. It may or may not be right. God, I need to hear what you have to say. This is where waiting on God is so important. And also leaving it in God's hands and allowing him in his time to indicate what it is that he wants. I don't know about you. I could probably point to a number of times in my life where I made a decision I thought was a pretty good decision based on, you know, common sense or this type of thing, rationale, and I find out later, oh man, I really missed that. I don't know how I missed that. And it's usually because I'm, I'm, I'm impetuous. I don't want to wait. Many in our society, you might be one of these people, we're kind of like that. We, we, you know, we, we live in a world where we don't have to wait for stuff. We, we want to get our food quickly. So we go through a drive through and, and, you know, we don't want to have to, um, put a lot of time and effort into something. What's the payoff? Is this going to be worth it to me? You know, I read a testimony this week uh, of a man that was, uh, his goal was to, are you ready for this? His goal was to lose 500 pounds. How big you got to be if you're going to lose 500 pounds? I spent 15 minutes reading this article. I, I was so, and I thought to myself, well, you're not going to lose that in three weeks. No. He's been a few years in the process. And it showed pictures of him, him of course. He was just a young man in his mid-20s, and he was, he was like set around 700 pounds. So he said, my goal is to lose 500 pounds. So he's lost, he's about three or four years into it. He's lost 285 pounds, which is remarkable. And what he says in the article is, I still have 215 uh, pounds to go. Um, but he's been at it for almost, like about four years. Clearly, he knows to do the right thing, it's going to take some time. Are you willing to wait on God for stuff that you're praying for? Or do you got to have it now? It's like, Lord, uh, I'm praying. I know you got the right answer, but time's running out. Can you please get on with it? The apostles here are in no hurry. Hey, if God took two weeks, two months, two years, they would have waited until God made it clear who it was. Now, it turns out he did it right away. And it says they cast lots. You might say, what? You mean to tell me they went and prayed and sought God and said, God, what do you say about this? And then they basically rolled dice. Like, And then isn't that kind of leaving God out of it? Don't impress your Western thinking on this Eastern text, okay? The casting of a lot was an important way of, the, of determining decisions. What they did was they wrote names on stones, put them in a vessel, and shook the vessel and the Stone that came out, whose ever name that was, that's who got it. Oh, I know what you're thinking. That's pretty hokey. Isn't that kind of like drawing straws? I guess it is kind of like drawing straws. As a matter of fact, uh, Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase of this verse uses that phrase, they drew straws. No. There's a verse in the Old Testament, Proverbs 16, verse 33, that says this. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. You know what the apostles were saying? We're going to put the names of, of Joseph, Barsabbas, and Matthias on a stone each. Maybe they put five at each, so they had ten in there. I don't know, shook the thing up. And whatever stone comes out, we know that God will have directed what stone should fall out. Now, if you're still having trouble with that, we need to understand that, that when you're believing that God dictates the course of our life, and you live your life that way, these men lived their life that way. They didn't say, well, when it's convenient, I'll use this method. When it's not, I'll use something else. No, they, when you live your life that you trust God for everything, then it's not a problem with casting lots. They want to know who God is choosing. Now, I want to say something here about Joseph Barsabbas, okay? So Matthias, I don't know how they did it. Maybe they put him out of the room, they took the vote, and then called him back in, said, uh, you know, it was moved and seconded. Maybe they did Robert's Rules of Order, I don't know. And, uh, you know, Matthias has been chosen. 
I want to imagine for a moment what it was like to be Joseph Barsabbas. Now, this isn't really the thrust of my message today, but it just I, I feel like it's something that might address some of you out there. Sometimes we don't get to do what we want to do. We have a goal for something, and we have a plan, an aspiration, and it doesn't work out. Maybe we were applying for a job, we were sure, I know I'm going to get this job. I, I submit my resume. I mean, for sure, it's a lock. I'm going to get this thing. And you find out they boiled it down to, you know, five interviews after they got 50 resumes. And then the five interviews, they, 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 they a second interview with two people. And you're sure, I know I'm the one. And then you're not. You're the Joseph Barsabbas. How do you feel about that? The Bible doesn't say anything more. It doesn't tell us what the reaction was by Matthias and Joseph Barsabbas. It doesn't say a thing. Did Joseph Barsabbas pitch a fit? Say, um, your next conversation with me will be through my lawyer. Um, this is defamation of character. Uh, you know, this is discrimination. My goodness, I, I drank snake venom one time in front of a bunch of unbelievers. Like, what more do I got to do to prove I'm worthy to be one of these apostles? It doesn't say anything like that. I doubt he... I doubt he had any rebuttal to their decision. I'll tell you why. Because he had been in and out with them all the time since the baptism of John the Baptist uh, and through the ushering in of the ministry of Jesus, all through the three years of Jesus' ministry. Joseph was, Bar Barsabbas was in and out through that time. He wasn't in on every conversation, neither was Matthias. He was there and he witnessed the death of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. He was also there as a witness of the resurrection. And so when the decision was, this is who the Lord has chosen, I think Joseph Barsabbas was probably the first one to say, you know, some amen, God has a different plan for me. Let God give you a plan B. If your plan A isn't what God chooses for you, even though you really want and you think that's what it is, allow God to use your plan B because he's got a plan B if you'll let him. That's not where I was going with this message, but I just feel like there's some people that need to hear that today that, you know, we have goals, we have desires, you know, of what we want to do. Uh, when I was at University uh, of Windsor a number of years ago, I was in the biology uh, department there. I was taking my degree. And originally I thought that God wanted me to be a doctor, to go to, to follow through medicine, go on the mission field that way. I really struggled in my studies at the University of Windsor. My marks, my goodness, you wouldn't want me to be your doctor. I, it would be more like, uh, um, you know. Dr. Seuss, but anyway, I just, but I started to get disillusioned and I really felt, God, don't you want me to be a doctor on the mission field? I could be of some great service to you, Lord. And, and I even thought I would be a missionary full-time. I did some mission work after university was over. Um, actually, between my last two years there, um, I really enjoyed it. I had a couple experiences there, uh, but I didn't feel God was calling me to do that. And somewhere in there, I felt the Lord was, was saying, no, Brian, I want to reinforce something in your life that I was speaking to your life many years earlier when I was around grade grade four, age 10, 11, around there, that I was to be a pastor. And so I finished my degree in biology and I went to seminary. Hey, I've, I've been a pastor now since 1986. Um, it's where I want to be. It's where I feel I should be. But it wasn't where I thought I would be. You know, God wants to use each one of us and... But he's not going to be able to use you if you are waiting on him does not include doing business till he comes. If you're not sure where God is going to use you, just get busy doing some things that you know God will be pleased with. If you read in your Bible, feed the poor, start feeding the poor. I'm not saying you're going to do that for the rest of your days, but you know something. Start doing business, trading, using the gifts God's got uh, in you to do until he confirms where it is that he's got your life ambition or whatever. Or maybe, you know, sometimes God changes the direction of our life. Sometimes we're doing something for a number of years and God says, I want you to leave that and do this. When I was at seminary, uh, my introductory Greek class had a gynecologist, a dentist, two other uh, general practitioners, and a pharmacist. They all left that to become a pastor. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Uh, hey, they felt God called them. Some of them had been in it for years. One man was in his mid-50s when he left being a general practitioner as a doctor and the salary that goes with it, and he became a pastor. So sometimes God uses us in different ways, but we need to wait on God and hear what he's having to say. I, I, I want to quote Joyce Meyer. She wrote a book a number of years ago called Enjoy where you are on the way to where you're going. So the only way to do that is to be satisfied with waiting on God, praying, and then seeking the Lord where I'm at in this station of my life until God dictates otherwise. 
The apostles did that. They've got Matthias. His name is on one of those foundation stones uh, in the New Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to bet all my money in, in the bank on that. I know because he was he was picked the right way. God chose him. God's chosen you for a task as well, or tasks. He's got work for you to do. Don't waste this time that we're in solitary confinement uh, or isolation, whatever you want to call it. Don't waste this time. God has something for you to do. Wait on him in prayer. Seek him. Let's find out what it is. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for how the apostles didn't just stand around or pace the floor nervously for those 10 days between the time, time that Jesus went up to heaven and when the, when the Holy Spirit came down. They were doing business. They put some important things in place so that they were ready when the Holy Spirit came for those 12 men to be leading this church, these new believers who would start to change the world with the message of Jesus Christ. Lord, you're still doing that kind of work today. Those of us watching this service today, Lord, you've got something for us to do, but we need to hear from you. It's got to be what you want. It can't be what I want. It may be what I want, but it's got to be first and foremost what you want. Would you help us, Lord, to wait upon you in prayer? and pray and believe and let you direct our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week, everybody. See you next week.